get for y'all. Second Science Cafe in our dopamine series. Everybody's talking about dopamine. Um, a lot of exciting brain science going on at the University of Arizona, and we're gonna learn about more of it this evening. Um, for those of you who may not have been here before, my name is Shepard Reed, and I work at the Flandra Science Center and Planetarium. We have a lot of great science exhibits, and we have really cool planetarium shows, so if you haven't come lately, come check us out. Um, and we are part of a number of science out outreach sites from the University of Arizona. If you're curious, come check out our uh, display rack here. You can learn about all the science outreach sites. We also, we should have had these last time, but we do have them this time. We have the brochures that talk about all the different science cafe series. Right now there is, improbably there are five different science cafe series organized by the University of Arizona going on in different places around town. Um, so there's a lot to check out, and I know some people who, uh, who are Science Cafe regulars are at the College of Science Lecture Series. As we talked about last time, unfortunately, we overlapped with them. Normally they do Monday nights and we do Tuesday nights, but I'm glad to see all of you here this evening. Um, and I'm gonna make one last uh, shout out for uh, Flandra. We have a new uh, Sharks exhibit that's opening on February 22nd just a couple weeks. Um, and so there's a lot of really cool interactives, giant shark models. Um, we have huge shark tail models that are really cool. Um, so that, that's a lot of fun. Uh, definitely fun for the kids and the grandkids. Um, so please come visit us and see that. At the same time, we'll start showing a new full dome planetarium show about great white sharks. So that's also very exciting and thrilling. Um, and those will those will debut together. Um, and with that, I'm going to get back to our science cafe tonight. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Julie Miller. She is an assistant professor in neuroscience, in speech, language, and hearing sciences, in neurology, and at the Bio5 Institute. Uh, she's very accomplished. Um, she's she's uh, cross disciplinary. And we're really thrilled to have her here this evening. So please give a big round of applause, Dr. Julie Miller. Thank you. Everyone can hear me okay. We're gonna get I'm gonna get adjusted as we go. So I'm very pleased to see so many people here, and it's a pleasure to be here. So I appreciate the invitation from the College of Science. Some of you who were here last month heard from Dr. Stephen Cowan who talked about dopamine in the brain in a rodent model. I'll touch on dopamine today as with respect to birdsong. So first, I'd like to begin by actually asking all of you a series of questions. How many of you, with a show of hands, have bird feeders or have had bird feeders in the past? How many of you have wondered when those birds, song, when those birds sing, who are they singing to? What, what do their songs mean? Right? Many of you. Okay. Now, I can't tell you when one bird sings to another, I can't tell you that he's talking about the weather or what he had for breakfast. But what I can tell you is that his song is both a form of territorial defense. So he's indicating where he is in his territory. He's signaling to predators or, or birds of his species for courting purposes that, A, I'm here. Now, what I'm gonna tell you about tonight is how birdsong can tell us about how we communicate. 
I'm going to address two major questions. First, the first major question is, what do singing birds have to do with speech learning and production? I'm gonna walk you through a developmental timeline for learning of bird song and speech and discuss some of the parallels between them. Then we'll move on to talking about the brain circuitry and how the songbird brain is actually very similar to structures in our brain for speech, language, and hearing. So what you'll take away from this is if you call somebody a bird brain, it actually means that they're quite smart. <laughs> then I'm gonna share with you some data from my own research laboratory about how we can use bird song as a model to study aging human voice. Finally, I'll end this section with a lead-in to talking about part two, which is what is the role of dopamine in speech and bird song? For that, we're gonna discuss how loss of dopamine contributes to speech and movement problems in Parkinson's disease. And I'll share with you some insights that have been obtained both from songbirds and other animal species about understanding the mechanisms behind this dopamine loss in the brain. Now, as I address these two questions, we're gonna focus on a particular species of songbird. This is the zebra finch. Now, in this species, the males sing, and that's shown here on the left. This is a male zebra finch. We know he's a male, not just because he does the singing, but because he has this orange cheek patch here and he has this polka dot and a brown co coloration. Now over here, this is the female zebra finch. She doesn't have that coloration. Now you notice now she doesn't sing, okay? But she has the ability to judge how good his song is. So, she has highly developed structures for auditory processing in her brain that distinguishes between a practice version of his song or a performance-based song. And you can guess which one she prefers. Right? Now, the male zebra finch, his brain is wired early in development for song due to the influence of hormones and genetics. And I'll mention a little bit more about that later. Now, this is a timeline that shows human vocal development on the top and bird song development on the bottom. So I'm gonna walk you through this and point out some interesting parallels. So as many of you know, the first six months of a baby's life, I'll wait for the streetcar to pass. The first six months of a baby's life is really about listening to an adult tutor. This might be a parent, anybody in the environment that's surrounding this young baby where that baby is listening. It's actively listening and it's forming in its brain a template that will become its speech and language. Around six to six to eight months, the baby is still actively listening, but it starts babbling. It starts vocally babbling and starts correcting itself. And then around a year or so or two years, you have the production of first words. Now clearly in us, auditory feedback and social interactions are critical to proper speech and language development. In the male zebra finch, that young juvenile listens to his father or another adult tutor, and he listens just like that human baby, and he's forming a template in his brain of his father's song. He's listening, and then, now this process in zebra finch is speeded up. We're talking about just a couple of months from hatching to the adult song. And so he also is undergoing this listening phase, and then he's practicing and self-correcting. So he's listening to his song, he's correcting it, 
And the other important component is that he starts to vocally babble. And we call this subsong. And I'm gonna play for you later some examples of adult song, but what happens is after about three to four months, he has an adult version of his song. Now you're probably wondering, is this the same song that he uses throughout his adulthood? The structure is the same, but he's actively fine tuning it. So what that means is he's, for example, he's varying the pitch. So let's say he courts a female, she doesn't like his song. He sits there, he repractices it, maybe changes his tune a little bit to make it more appealing, okay? Now, uh, in other species of songbirds, such as canaries, they do change their song each season, okay? So there are advantages to studying different species of songbirds. So we have these similar developmental timelines for learning bird song and speech. And now I'm gonna share with you, what does the brain circuitry look like? So this is a side-by-side -side view of the human brain here on the right and the songbird brain here on the left. So I wanna point out that the songbird brain has these unique specializations their brain nuclei, which means there's clusters of neurons that are wired together specifically for song and not other type of behavior. So these structures uh, you see here are represented by these circles. They have abbreviations. The one that's most noticeable here is called Area X, okay? Very fancy name. And air, there's a story behind it, so later if I have time, I'll, I'll try to remember the story. But area X, so area X sits in the basal ganglia. So the basal ganglia is present in both birds and in us. It's really important for motor control. You're gonna hear about it a little bit later with respect to Parkinson's disease. So the song system consists of these brain nuclei that are dedicated to song learning and production. They're wired in a specific way. And then that brain information goes down to the vocal organ in songbirds, which we refer to as the syrinx, which is similar to our larynx. Now, it's been shown through a lot of studies done by my colleagues and others, as well as myself, that these regions in the songbird brain that are important for learning and production are homologous. They're similar to regions in the human brain for speech, language, and auditory processing. So you might have heard of Broca's region. That's a region that's important for speech initiation and processing. Broca's region is actually very similar to another region here, a song nucleus called Elman. Basal ganglia in humans, that's also important for speech and learning, has its homologous area X. Now, some of these studies involve looking at genes in the brain, and one of those genes is called FOXP2. And what we know is that a mutation in this gene gives rise to a speech and language disorder, and people have studied this gene and how it functions in songbirds by changing levels of this gene in area X. And in fact, if you change levels of FOXP2 while the bird is learning the song from his father, it actually interferes with his ability to learn. Now this ability to learn, we call vocal learning. And humans, songbirds, elephants, whales, there's a few species that have this property of vocal learning. And it means you have the ability to create new sounds through hearing yourself and others. And so we're gonna go on to talk about adult bird song. And what I want you to appreciate is that these birds have already learned their song, but they're actively fine tuning it through listening and social interactions. And it's, these, it's this listening and social interactions that's influencing their brain and vice versa. So we're talking about brain and behavior and how they interact. Now, you're probably wondering 
how do you measure birdsong? And does it look anything like how we measure a human sentence? So we, <laughs> somebody's singing, they must hear my talk. Okay, so this is what we call a spectrogram. It's a visual depiction of sound. So if you record any sort of sound, my voice, or a bird song through a microphone, and you put it through a program, a software program, you can generate this spectrogram where this is time on this axis and frequency or intensity on this axis. Now, a bird song, I'm gonna play it for you. It's very repetitive. So we're gonna play this song, and then I'm gonna describe it for you. Is it not coming through the speaker? All right, I think we, uh, we we had it set and then it, it went away, um, unfortunately. Let me see if we try it this way. No. Nope. Yeah, it's the same issue we had before. I'm wondering if you can put, if you can mic that. Okay, we're gonna try and do a manual mic here. There you go, you hear that? Yeah. Over and over and over again, okay? <laughs> Thank you. I'll let you know when we're ready for the next one. So this repetition that he's doing is basically a series of units we call motifs, and he's, in those motifs are these syllables, A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E. Now in human, in a human sense, so this human sentence actually says, shh, finches perch in trees. Shh, finches perch in trees. So what I want you to appreciate is that shh here, if you see this uh, word here, shh, you've got some noisy energy here, just like you do here. Now, if you look at the E's in trees, we have what's called a harmonic structure. The birds have a harmonic structure. Now, it doesn't look exactly alike, but what we can do is, much as in the way that we measure changes in human voice, we can measure changes in the bird song by measuring changes in the pitch of some of these individual syllables here. We can measure how loud they are, how noisy they are, and timing. So, now that I've told you how we can measure bird song in a matter similar to human voice. I'm gonna share with you some studies we've done in bird song. Now, first, I'd like to introduce you to this topic of aging human voice. And so what Maya Angelou says here is that words mean more than what's said in paper. It takes the human voice to infuse them with deeper meaning. So our voices are very important how we speak, it's how we communicate with the world. So if you have problems with your voice, and as we age, unfortunately, we do experience changes in our voice and our speech, this can obviously affect your ability to communicate. So beginning middle age, it can occur at any age, but beginning at middle age, we start to see vocal disorders. And this can be due to natural aging, as well as changes in the brain due to neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's. And of course, changes in our voice may also reflect hearing loss. And I'd like to introduce two of my colleagues here from the Department of Speech, Language, and Hearing. I'll just ask them to stand up and give a little wave. <laughs> Dr. Robin Sandlin, who's a voice researcher, and Dr. Nicole Maroney, who is a hearing researcher, and there's a number of flyers and brochures on the table there where you can go to our speech and hearing clinics and living well with hearing loss or go to the voice disorders clinic if you experience any difficulties or you know someone who does. Um, and so Dr. Sandlin and I started a collaboration to ask, oh, uh, so let me, let me back up. So Dr. Sandlin and I started a collaboration. I'm gonna tell you about that on the next slide, but let me set the stage for you. So as we age, there's changes in our voice. These changes may include a hoarse, breathy voice. We may have experienced changes in our pitch. 
Most treatment for voice disorders is targeted at the level of our larynx. And so there's behavioral treatments, there's some surgical treatments. I'm sure Robin will be happy, Dr. Samler will be happy to answer questions about that after the talk. But suffice it to say, because we don't know what's going on in the brain, what is the contribution of the brain to vocal motor control as we age? And so we want to answer this question. And to answer this question, we really need to look at animal models. And so what we did is we took a cross-sectional population of songbirds, young adults, middle-aged adults, so at the midpoint of their lifespan, and then elder birds. Now, birds, birds live about five years in our laboratory environment, so we raise them in our colony at the university. And so we have some exciting findings. So here, this is data that represents groups of birds, young uh, and middle and elder adult birds. And this, we're measuring how loud their songs are. Now what you can see here is that as they age, their songs get louder. So one natural, hypothesis is that maybe there's a problem with hearing, either loss of hair cells or something in the brain having to do with auditory processing. Now, the other interesting finding is that we noticed that middle-aged birds have noisier songs. This is indicated by a lower score here compared to young age young adult birds and so this measure is commonly used in human voice studies to say a voice is very noisy or very breathy and so maybe these middle-aged birds are experiencing breathy voice we don't know because we don't know what's going on both at the level of the syrinx and the brain however what's interesting here is that all of a sudden their songs get better, they get less noisy as they go from middle to elder age. So there's some sort of compensatory mechanism here that's being engaged. One possibility is that these birds are constantly singing. Maybe because they're exercising so much, this is promoting recovery, okay? And so, because they're singing all the time, there may be things going on in the brain. If you've heard of neurogenesis, new neurons being born, we know that that happens in songbirds throughout their life. So there may be new neurons being born, new connections that are helping to compensate for any problems due to natural aging. So in the future, my laboratory is gonna be investigating what is going on in terms of what's happening in the brain with respect to these changes we see in birdsong with age. Now, moving on to part two, age is also a major risk factor for Parkinson's disease. So, I, you know, I'm not trying to depress anyone here. This is, you know, knowledge is power. Uh, and age, though, it turns out, is a risk factor for a number of things. Uh, and, However, I also think that wisdom, wisdom comes with age, so we balance it out, right? And so here, I'm gonna walk you through some basic insight into Parkinson's disease, because we're gonna talk a little bit about the speech problems in Parkinson's. So this is a human brain, and what this shows is that you have a structure, it's a really tiny structure here, it's shown in purple, it's very important. It's called the substantia nigra. The substantia nigra contains neurons that produce a chemical, a neurotransmitter called dopamine. We know dopamine is important for reward. Dopamine is also important for movement and for speech motor control. And what happens is that, um, now I'm gonna cover this. Uh, I'm trying not to block anyone here. So. What happens is that in Parkinson's, the primary path
pathology is a loss of or death of these dopamine producing neurons. So these dopamine producing neurons send their axons, their nerve fibers, to a region called the striatum. It's part of the basal ganglia. It's very important for motor control. So you can imagine if you lose do dopamine, these circuits don't function properly. Research traditionally has focused on the limb motor symptoms because that's how it gets diagnosed. You present with limb motor symptoms, you have a tremor, you go to the neurologist. Well, here's the key. By the time you go to a neurologist, 50 to 60% of your dopamine producing neurons are gone. We need to be able to diagnose it earlier. And there's evidence that voice and speech changes occur years earlier. So potentially this could be an early treatment target. Now, what do I mean by changes in your voice or speech with Parkinson's? I mentioned that with age, you get some changes in your voice, a hoarse, breathy, monotonous voice. In Parkinson's, these features are exacerbated. So they are more progressive, they're more noticeable. Some of them are similar, so you get a tremor, a soft voice, a flat pitch. Also, we see problems with speaking, too fast or too slow. Now, the treatments for Parkinson's for speech are largely behavioral. 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 And you can see that I have a little articulatory deficits tonight. So, <laughs> thank you, thank you. So these treatments are effective, but a lot of individuals don't seek them out or they seek them out late, okay? And there are also some surgical treatments. Now, some of you have probably heard about levodopa, dopamine replacement. Dopamine replacement helps with the limb motor symptoms, but it's not a quick fix for the voice and speech problems. It's like what I tell my students is, it's like taking a jackhammer where you're trying to just throw lots of dopamine at the brain by taking an oral medication. It's not a quick fix. Our speech is complex, okay? There's a lot of processing going on in the brain. So we really need pharmacological and surgical treatments that will target these voice and speech deficits early, okay? And so people in the field, including myself, oops, we're not there yet, have used animal models to look at if you change, if you change the amount of dopamine in the brain, okay, in the basal ganglia, can you model some of the human vocal deficits? Yes, you can, and we've done it in songbirds, where we slightly reduce, we use a drug to mimic a little bit of Parkinson's, we slightly reduce dopamine in the basal ganglia, and the birds have a very flat song. They can still sing, and they're jumping and flying, but they have some deficits in their song. And so we really want to uncover what are those cellular pathways that are affected? And so I've listed some, some research here, but before, so there's, to summarize, there's, there's a wealth of data that says that voice and speech problems are prevalent in Parkinson's disease. It's hard for us to really understand what the brain is doing in humans, so we turn to animal models. And songbirds, because they have this wonderful vocal brain circuitry, and we don't know much about the vocal circuitry in rodents, for example, we can use them to study not just what's happening in Parkinson's and normal aging, but we can really get at what is dopamine doing in the brain? What is, what is the signaling? What are the genes and circuits that are sensitive to dopamine and that are important for the bird song. And so this is the second question, is what's this role of dopamine just in normal bird song and how does it relate to speech? And so I started my talk by describing the male finch sings a practice song. This is a song that he sings by himself with the goal to use a well-rehearsed song to a female. 
okay? So we call these states practice versus performance. So it's a social context dependent behavior. Now I'm gonna show you a video of a male performing to a female. Let me just get it set up here. Um, Shiver, we might have to do a microphone again. Okay, so I'm gonna point things out as you watch the video. <laughs> got angry. The bird, yes, the uh, male pitch is impatiently waiting to sing. Okay, we'll give it just a minute. <laughs> so I'm going to, in this video, as it's thinking, I'm going to show you a male zebra finch trying to court a female. So this is in a chamber where we're watching him through a video camera and we're, we're watching him direct his song to a female. So you'll see sometimes they're interested, sometimes they're not, sometimes they turn their back on him. Uh, and so he's not, there's a barrier. He's not allowed to, um, to have contact with her. So we're not encouraging mating at this time. We're just collecting his, we're just collecting that song. Okay, so something is, okay, let me try this again. Yeah, it looks like it's, uh, let me see, I might have to restart it. Okay, sorry about this, it's just, uh, needs to reboot. It worked before. Worked before, okay. Oh, that was you. You were, uh, we have a, <laughs> I might ask you to sing for me. Sorry, bear with me, folks. Oh, um, can you put the microphone up to the, the 
it's going to be about uh, 30 seconds or so, maybe not just yet. So what you're going to see is he's going to notice her all of a sudden, and he's going to come down here, and he's going to sing to her. So hopefully you'll be able to hear that. If we time it well between the train leaving and the next tram coming. <laughs> All right. Hope everyone's enjoying their pizza. <laughs> so great question. These birds, I did, these birds are originally from Australia, but they actually, these birds came from a colony at UCLA. All right, so there's, there he is. He's excited. He's gonna, he should be singing to her. You hear that? You hear that up there? She decided she's gonna eat. <laughs> <laughs> now she's interested. She's like, oh, look. You see, he's, he's doing everything he can to get her attention. Now, eventually he's gonna get, he's gonna give up a little bit. But he'll do a hop, he'll do a dance, he'll do a beat wipe. All right, thank you, Shipper. All right. Different cages, so they, well, they're in the same cage, but the cage has a divider. So they can look, but they can't touch. Now, I showed you this video, and you can imagine when he's singing by himself, he usually stays in place. He sings, he's perching, he's practicing. So let's talk about how those songs are different and what's going on in terms of dopamine in the brain. So when he's singing by himself, he's practicing, his song is more variable. He's trying a few different tweaks to it. He's varying his pitch. It's not a perfect song. He might be switching up the timing. The general structure is the same. Now, when he's performing to the female in the video that I showed you, it's much more rehearsed. He's bearing his pitch a lot less. She actually can discriminate when he's varying his pitch too much in his song. She doesn't like that. But if it's too flat, she doesn't like that either. Wow. So it's a dance between these different variations of his song. And what we know is that dopamine levels are low when he's performing by himself. And when he's performing to a female, they're much higher. And so we know that these dopamine levels are different in area X. That is the region I told you about a little bit earlier, where area X is this song dedicated subregion of the zebra finch basal ganglia. So thinking about vocal motor control, we know that there are dopamine producing neurons in the substantia nigra, that midbrain structure I talked about earlier that we have, the birds have it too. Those neurons send fibers to area X and then while that bird is singing in these two different states, the singing behavior is controlling how much dopamine there is. And also the brain circuitry is determining how much dopamine there is. So it's a back and forth crosstalk that's going on. And so I told you that dopamine changes its levels. We know that dopamine modulates pitch in the bird song. So if you look at these harmonic syllables in the bird song, and you measure the pitch, which is the number shown along here, when that bird is practicing by itself, you see how each of these dots is a syllable from a different bird. You can see that he has quite a pitch range, right? He's trying a bunch of different things out. Then when that female, as soon as that female is there, he decreases the range of his pitch. We know that dopamine precisely controls this because when you administer drugs in the bird to block dopamine receptors in area X, you can actually switch this pitch to this pitch. So that's really exciting. And um, as I finish up here, I wanna share with you some research from my own laboratory where we ask about the molecules in area X in the brain that control how much dopamine's getting released. So there's a protein called alpha-synuclein 
It's a protein that assists in cell-to-cell -cell communication. And this protein actually is known to regulate dopamine. And in fact, here's an interesting tidbit, in Parkinson's disease, there are known abnormalities in this protein. This protein is one of the major pathological findings in individuals in their brain who have Parkinson's disease. And so we're just looking here normally, a normal singing bird, a male singing by himself versus to a female, we're just asking, what is this protein doing? What is alpha-synuclein protein doing? Is it responding to the context that bird's in and how much it's singing? And so what you see here on this x-axis, motif means how much the bird sings in a two-hour period. Each point here represents a different bird. And what you can see is, this is levels of this alpha-synuclein protein. You see this curve here when he's singing by himself. It turns out that when that male is practicing by himself, the more he sings, the more he's driving up levels of this alpha-synuclein protein in the brain. Now, what that's doing to dopamine release, we don't know yet. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Now, when he's singing to that female, you see it's very flat. So we have this difference just based upon whether that male's by himself, singing to the female and how much he's singing. And so we go back to this idea that vocal exercise is so important because vocal exercise, even for us, can drive changes in our genes and in our circuits and our brain throughout our life. And it means that we have neuroplasticity. We have plasticity and flexibility in our brains. And so before I acknowledge uh, my lab and my collaborators, I just want to summarize what I've shared with you today. So I've shared a number of important critical insights into what we know about how human speech and language develops and how it's produced by looking at bird song and examining what vocal development looks like, what the brain structure of a bird looks like, how we can study aging human voice by looking at bird song, and also looking closely at bird song as a model to understand how dopamine modulates the bird song and how the bird song can modulate dopamine in the brain. And I'd like to end with just sharing with you a photo of my lab. I have a couple of them contributed to the projects I talked about today. Lisa So, my graduate student, Maureen Bodwal, my undergraduate student. Um, I mentioned Dr. Sandlin for Aging Voice. And of course, I'm so happy to have all of my colleagues here. I didn't have time to talk to you about other projects in the lab, but Dr. Stephen Cowan, who spoke last month, and I have a future collaboration. Our bird colony is well taken care of by University Animal Care. And then I've got some funding for some of what we I've talked about today. Thank you. <laughs> happy, I'm so happy to take questions. Shippard's going to have the microphone to pass around. So raise your hands. Feel free to ask some questions. All right. I, one, two, one. There we go. I saw a hand go right up over here. So I'm going to go there first. Okay, but I'll get great. to you uh, in the order that I see the hands go up. Thank you. You mentioned hormones and and, uh, te and and genetics controlling language acquisition, but I don't recall your covering it. Yes, you'd like some more details about that. Yes. Yes. Great. So early in, in development in the male zebra finch brain. So in the male zebra finch brain, early in development. There are steroid hormones, estradiol and testosterone, right? We're very familiar with those. It turns out that estradiol, not testosterone, masculinizes the brain. So estradiol hormone spikes, it goes up at a certain critical period in that developing hatchling brain that causes those song dedicated brain nuclei that I talked about, like area X, like other structures, it causes them to grow big, to branch out, 
and make connections with each other. Now the female finch doesn't get that hormone at that time. And this is interesting, studies of my colleagues many years ago, so songbird research goes back to the 1960s and 70s. Colleagues of mine have shown in these early studies that if you give a female finch early in development, if you give her enough estradiol, she will develop male-like soft structures in the brain and she can sing. Now that's not everything. Genetics, on the topic of genetics, they, on the male and the female chromosomes of these finches, they have certain defining genes and characteristics that also help to masculinize the system. And there's some interesting examples of finches that are born both male and female. And they're, they're actually, um, there's a name for them called gonadomorphs. And so there's a couple of examples. And in fact, for those of you who keep up with some news, there was recently an article that described this in nature. Yeah, great question. Is there a similar Uh, so the question was, is there a similar human analog for... The effect of hormone and genetic uh, language acquisition? You know, that is, so the question was, is there a human analog for the effects of hormones and genetics? Not that I know of, that we've discovered yet. Certainly we know in humans that steroid hormones are important, like testosterone as masculinizing the male brain and estradiol, the female brain. Uh, we know that based on genetics, there are certain gene mutations that happen that give rise to speech and language disorders. We know that those genetic mutations can cause structural problems in the brain of humans because there are neural imaging studies. But we really, you know, unless my colleagues want to chime in here, we really don't know that much about how steroid hormones and genetics, you know, together or interact and where in the brain exactly to give rise to speech and language development. Do you want to, uh, Dr. Fabiano Smith, do you have anything yeah, to add? That was a beautiful, very okay. elegant explanation. Okay, thank you. Well done. All right, I, I see the uh, hand going up all the way in the back. I'm coming to you. It's gotten a little chilly out. I'm uh, curious whether there's a relationship between migratory behavior and, and song, in the songs. <coughs> Maybe that, not. So that's an excellent question. Um, the question was, is there a relationship between songs and migratory behavior? These finches we study in the lab, so although they fly in their cage, you know, they're not migratory per se. Um, and I, you know, I don't know enough about the topic. It's an excellent question. Uh, certainly finches and other songbird species tend to stay where they are. Um, you know, these finches live in Australia, unless of course they come into the US. A lot of people have finches as pets here. Uh, but yeah, in terms of, of regular migratory birds, I don't know. Great question though. Yeah. I have a question also about uh, how do you draw these samples and uh, how difficult are they to obtain? Blood draws? Sorry, where is the, um, I'm just looking for, oh, you're over there, okay. Just Sorry, so I can she, uh, she took the, the, the microphone so I didn't have a chance, but she's, she's, she's right here. I'm going to give her the microphone back so she can yes. keep talking. Yes. How do you obtain the samples so that you can draw your conclusions? Are they blood draws or do you sacrifice the bird or how does this all work? Yes, great question. So um, in order to do the studies of the brain, the protein studies, we do need to sacrifice the birds. We do it in a very humane way. Of course, we're under a very strong regulatory oversight. And so when you want to look at changes in the brain, we take the tissue and we do a couple different things in the laboratory. So to get protein, we'll take area X, that basal ganglia structure, we'll take a little tube, we'll grind it up, we'll run it um, on an across an electric field and look at proteins and measure their expression 
other people will measure, and we do this in the lab too, will measure changes in mRNA. Now for the aging studies that I've mentioned, here the birds were not sacrificed. We're just looking at how their changes in song change with age. But certainly, as many of you know, in order to move the field forward and really understand what's going on in the brain, we do need to take, take the brains and do a number of different studies on them. And the neat thing is, because we know exactly where these structures are in the brain, we can actually link changes in protein with how much they're singing and various features, like their pitch. Great question. Others? Yeah, we've got two more here, so I'm gonna get this one first. Uh, I just wondered if birds or any other animal species get Parkinson's, and if they don't, is that because they don't live long enough? That's a great question. So the question was, um, do birds or other species just naturally get Parkinson's? We have not, and my colleagues have not noticed any Parkinson's in our birds just naturally. Now, maybe they don't live long enough. These birds tend to have a lifespan of about five years. Um, they do, you know, of course, like with humans, sometimes they develop uh, cancer and things like that. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't happen a lot, but so we don't see this. Now, I will say that my colleagues who work in rodent models, who do aging studies, they do notice, for instance, that as the rats and mice age, they call less. They do show some brain pathology, um, just as a function of, you know, they might be nine months or two years. They do show slower motor control. We haven't observed this in the birds, but we also haven't looked for it. And I think it would be very interesting. Now it goes back to this idea that these birds are constantly singing. And we know that singing behavior throughout their adult life promotes new neurons being born. And so one idea is that they have this capacity maybe to, to hide or compensate for any sort of issues they're having, right? And so, you know, other colleagues say, well, look, if I start singing now, if I become part of a choir, will I get neurogenesis, right? We, we don't know, but I'll tell you, exercise has a lot of benefits for our brains. So great question. All right, we've got another question here, and I know I saw that hand, and that hand, and the hand over here. So I will get to you in the order that I saw those hands go up. Thank you for your presentation, Doctor. Uh, you mentioned early in your presentation that there are a lot of similarities between uh, avian brain and the human brain. Do the songs, bird songs, and human vocalization, vocalizations, uh, do they share any deeper structure? The reason I ask is because Mr. Deep Syntax is now resident of U of M. Yes, so the question was, um, I had talked about human acoustic structure, what, what the sentences look like versus bird song and how we can make these various measurements. And the question was, do the birds have a syntax, a language, much how we have language? And you are referencing uh, Noam Chomsky, who's here at the U of A, uh, who's a big language syntax person. So what, what the, the birds have, the songbirds have, is yes, they have a syntax in that they have a very precise order in which they utter their song. So I mentioned that they sing A, B, C, D, E, a, B, C, D, E, over and over again. That order is their, the order of their syllables in their song is a syntax. Now, other species of Bengalis will vary that order as adults. Zebra finch, not so much. Others, these Bengalis, they'll change. Maybe I want to go from A to A, A to B, B to C. So they mix it up. Now, what we don't know that they have, which is where we diverge from the language folks, is we don't know that in their songs, they're conveying much meaning. We don't know what they say. And so I'm always careful whenever I get in a room with folks you know, from linguistics or who work on language, I'm very careful to say it's not a model for language, it's a model for speech motor control. Because we know that they're 
vocal motor control is very similar to us. We just don't know, you know, they clearly, do they have their own language in their songs? We don't know. Great question. Uh, Dr. Edgett here, um, my colleague in psychology has a question, but I think there was somebody else. Maybe. Okay, yeah, we have we have a few more okay. questions yep. back here, okay. and then I can okay. get up to the front, great. but this was the next hand that went up yep, right great. here. Yeah, great. Do all male songbirds sing? Is that, is that the case with all species? Uh, so, great question. The question was, do all male songbirds sing? Um, depends if species specific. So what it means is some species of songbirds, the females sing as well. So there are, for example, female canaries that will sing. And so, you know, why some species sing and others don't, there's gotta be some evolutionary reason for that, but I don't know. Yeah, so in zebra finch, the males sing, but certainly in other species, it can be both males and females. Great, great question. Yep, yeah, okay. Thank you, so now we have another one back here. Hi, um, so although your research is used while studying Parkinson's disease, I was wondering if your research act from bird songs actually opened the door to music therapy that's being used on brain damaged patients. So that is a wonderful question. The question was, um, is any of what we do, <laughs> is any of what we do have to do with, will it, any of our research, will it open up areas to, to looking at music therapy for brain injury patients. Did I paraphrase that correctly? So, great question. So we haven't looked at that yet. So I've talked about birdsong as a model for speech. I always get the question, um, if I don't answer it correctly in grant applications, what do singing birds have to do with human speech? Okay, so clearly we have, they have similar brain structures. There are colleagues who've published papers now that basically have shown brain structures in humans, if you record from them electrically, you can modulate one's voice at the level of the larynx, you can modulate pitch, you can all also modulate timing of speech, and that these are the same regions as in birds. Now, we would like to, my lab, when I get some more funding and down the road, we would love to make look at how singing can be used as music therapy for patients. We're not there yet, but certainly the principles we learn here about how good singing is for the brain and how it can change things in the brain would make one hypothesize that if there were techniques that allowed us to take humans and look at you know changes at the molecular cellular level while we're singing, we might get some insight into those questions. Yeah, we're a bit limited because right now we have neuroimaging techniques that when you're speaking or you're doing a task and under the scanner, you get regions of the brain will light up and you'll say and it'll state, this is active, this is less active. The problem is we don't know what's going on with the wiring. But yeah, great question. Yeah, All right. Oh, so I, know, I, see, I see that there's a hand up there, but there was a hand here that went up earlier, so I'm getting to this one first and I'll get to you up front. All right, one, two, and three. Given the similarities in the bird and human brain, have you done any research into some of the medi medications that are used on humans to uh, improve the dopamine situation, things like carbidopa, levodopa, and tacopone, things like that. Great question. So the question was, have we looked at any of the uh, drug medications used to treat Parkinson's in humans? Have we looked at them, at them in birds? Not yet. Great question. One of the goals of my lab, when I showed you the slide about looking at how dopamine signaling is regulated in the brain by alpha-synuclein, what we're doing is we're mapping out that molecular cellular pathway. The goal being to develop drugs that will target a receptor or target one of these proteins. Because I mentioned in humans, if you take a drug, that an oral medication, and that's supposed to boost dopamine synthesis in the brain, it really doesn't resolve the speech problems. 
And so my idea is, and this is something that's being followed up clinically, just in general with people who have Parkinson's, is you need to target the genetic mutations in the pathway. You know, you need to find where exactly is the gene or the circuit that that dopamine's acting on. And we need to do that for speech. So by mapping out what's going on in terms of basic mechanisms, my long-term goal is to exactly target with drug therapy these pathways. Great question. Okay. Thank you. So I know, I see that question yeah. over there. I know you, you said there was Dr. a question up here. up here. Okay, go here first. Okay. okay. Great. This is a little bit off topic, but um, when we were in Antarctica, we were told that the penguins who mate for life uh, recognized each other by their vocalization but they all sounded alike. <laughs> so I was just wondering if that was like, with those finches, do they mate with the same pair all the time? Do they know each other's song or kind of talk about that? Yeah, that's it. So the question was, uh, well, the anecdote was that, um, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Mindy, Mindy, um, my, my friend here who was playing the bird songs, Mindy said, you know, that she had been to, been to Antarctica and seen the penguins, and that the penguins seem to recognize their mates by their vocalizations. And does that happen with the zebra finches? How do they do that? And, and do they mate for life? Zebra finches, yes, they are very monogamous. They mate for life, unless something happens to a partner. And I will tell you, what's interesting is we've observed this over the years in our colony and others, if a partner dies, of, you know, and, and this is usually like when we breed our finches that you're talking about dying of natural causes, the other bird will notice. In fact, they will get depressed and you can see that they may, they may also die. You know, and it's, and it's unfortunate, similar to, you know, the studies in humans, you lose a partner. So in many ways, they're like us. The female absolutely recognizes her partner's song. So she has, and I mentioned this, she has such an amazing network of connections for auditory processing that she can tell the difference between her mate and other male songs. Now, I played you one song. Zebra finches don't all sound like that. They have different variations of their song. They go high, they go low, they have a different structure. So not all, we can actually hear differences between different pitch songs. And so the female can pick this up. A female also knows her father's song because she was raised with him. So yeah, so it's amazing that they have, you're never gonna think about bird brains in the same way, right? <laughs> Fascinating answer. Uh, so now uh, there's a question over here. Is that you? Oh. Um, so this whole idea of the structure, like the syntax or the ordering, I was just wondering if that's consistent across development or is there a way to knock that out or is it just something that emerges and stable, um, you know, given all the importance of syntax? So the great question. The question is, you know, with syntax, is there a way to experimentally manipulate it? What is it used for? Is it how, like, does it change over development? Did I paraphrase that correctly? So in the beginning, when the bird's learning his song, he's switching up the order of his syntax a lot. He's trying out different renditions of his song, and that includes changing the order. As he gets to an adult version of his song, that crystallizes. Now, colleagues of mine have published studies that show if you interfere with the bird's ability to hear his own song, and you do that by playing white noise, right, shh, during development, just like in us, if you introduce noise into your environment, it interferes with your ability to, to learn and to speak. So for those birds, if you introduce noise during this critical period of development, it actually messes up their syntax. However, they can get it back. As soon as you remove that noise, 
they practice into adulthood, they can actually develop their song normally. So it shows you that that critical period for development, it's not just fixed. And so um, there have been other studies, for instance, where you change the expression of a single gene, like the FOXP2 gene, and you can actually change the order, the syntax of their song. And those studies, though, have done it during development. In adulthood, it's more hardwired. Great question. Thank you. Um, oh, I see the hand going up back there. So coming back there to you. Lots of great questions. Here we go. Hi, so I was wondering, um, what do you, you personally hope the audience absorbs the most from this lecture? So what can we all take home from this that is the most important thing that you believe is? Are you, are you folks the journalism students? Yes, we yes. are. Yes, so there. <laughs> I, I got prepped. Because uh, you're doing a paper on this for your class, right? Yes. Correct. So, so you want to know, um, so you're going to put my direct quote in your paper then, right? <laughs> I have to come up with something good then. Uh, okay. Uh, so, so the take-home message is, you know, bird song is a lot like us in many different ways. We can take advantage of having this ability to quantify, to measure the song, and relate changes we see in the song to what we see in the brain. And it can tell us something about the basic mechanisms for how we develop and produce speech and language. How's that? Well done. <laughs> I, had a, I have a little paper, a piece of paper in my pocket. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a we have a second question up here. Okay. Are there any other folks out there? Um, well, I was wondering um, about people when you were talking about exercising the, the song, the, your speech, and whether um, being isolated individuals as they age, perhaps. I mean, is that a factor in what happens to their voices and? Conversely, if one continues to sing or speak a lot, whether that aging voice doesn't do the same kind of deterioration. So for this question, I'm actually gonna turn over to my colleague, Dr. Robin Samlin, who's a voice researcher. The question had to do with uh, social isolation. Do the effects of social isolation affect one's voice? Did I paraphrase that correctly? Absolutely, there's a use it or lose it component. We know that people who sing a lot retain their voices longer as they get older, and people who don't speak a lot or interact a lot tend to report more problems as they get older. Um, the, the voices get weaker faster and are harder to rehabilitate. So talk lots. And sing, right? And sing, yeah. <laughs> Not me. Don't, I don't <laughs> sing. So coming coming around, actually, I'm just going to hand this across the table. Now, here. now, if there's any questions on hearing and auditory processing, I'm happy to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Nicole Moroni. Yes. I, I just want to say, well, we're from Baltimore. And my husband has Parkinson's. But he, has, he belongs to a singing group that uh, is headed by the assistant in charge of the choral arts of Baltimore. And they do an off, they, they meet once a week and they do a lot of vocal exercises ending up with singing. And it is absolutely wonderful. We have seen such changes in people. And I'm sure you all have that here. But uh, just to let you know how successful that is, and Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University uh, underwrote that to begin with, and, uh, and now is still partially underwriting it. So. I, you know, I'm so glad you brought this up. I didn't have a chance to tell everyone here that there's a very strong community 
of support for individuals with Parkinson's. There's a number of, of chorus uh, groups of individuals that practice and teach. There's also the behavioral treatment I mentioned, Lee Silverman voice treatment is a vocal exercise which targets intensity or loudness. And that, one of the co-founders of that treatment uh, who is part of this company that travels the world teaching clinicians uh, how to do this is based here in Tucson. And so vocal exercise and in fact limb exercise, if you haven't heard of limb exercise, we have a gym here, it's called the Power Gym. It was founded by Dr. Becky Farley and I'm happy to send these resources out to be shared maybe on the College of Science page. There's a gym called the Power Gym, which is exercise for individuals with Parkinson's. So there's both voice treatment and exercise. You know, I wanna be careful. I don't wanna be all gloom and doom. There's a lot of very beneficial treatments out there. The goal is in a lot of these behavioral therapies, they help to alleviate symptoms. They improve quality of life. I'm sure you can attest to that. The issue is that some of the medications come with side effects. And particularly if we could try and intervene early and improve quality of life, that's an important goal. So thank you so much for bringing this up. Thank you, yes, it's encouraging. So we have another question here. Just a follow up on, you mentioning that uh, you've been studying gene expression. I guess that's in relation to Parkinson's and that particular disease. Do you foresee somewhere in the, I won't say distant future, but future, um, where techniques like CRISPR-Cas9 would be useful in, uh, I don't want to say combating, but addressing some of these deficiencies that you are noting? So this is, this is a great question. You have a science background? Mathematician, okay. So uh, this gentleman mentioned some of these, these latest genetic technologies like CRISPR. The goal is basically you go in and you go in with a portion of the gene and the, into the cell. And the idea is you're getting the cell through its natural machinery to, to churn out normal copies of the gene, for example. So, this gene editing technology, uh, I believe some of it, a lot of it's been done in animal models. I don't actually know yet. I think there's been some controversy. I think maybe it had been employed uh, with, um, uh, right, with um, uh, with babies. There was some something in China came out about it or Japan. That's right, that, that they were using this technology. As far as I know, there's, there's not current human clinical trials using this. Now, what I will tell you is, I haven't mentioned a technique that's called um, viral vectors. So these are viruses. So if you think about, we, have, we get viruses, we get the common cold. People have genetically engineered these types of viruses so that you can not get sick, but they put a gene in them. And the goal is you put a gene in, you inject this virus in a region of the brain, and you get this virus to turn on, the gene starts getting made, and the idea is that it's continually active, and that it should replace the dopamine loss, or it would inhibit the buildup of protein toxicity in the brain. I can tell you that this gene therapy approach, which you've probably heard about for cancer and other diseases, they are using it in Parkinson's. The, the gene editing is a little tough because you can imagine that if you edit a gene, you're gonna get unwanted side effects, right? You could be stimulating the immune system in a way that you don't wanna get. Now with viral vectors, of course there could be side effects, but that gene therapy is one of the most promising. Yeah, great question. Thank you. And looking around to see if there are any other hands up. Over here, got a question over here. Hello, uh, sorry 
my voice is under the weather. That's okay. And I was going to say, if you'd like to see Dr. Samlin. <laughs> well, as a former vocal performance major and musician, I was wondering if you had any plans to apply the same experiment to music students. <laughs> So you mean wow. the, the <laughs> <laughs> you mean the same experiment with respect to well in my own personal situations I would feel a different response internally of when I practice singing alone versus performing a very big difference interesting so so the question was as a vocal performer she wanted to know if we would take music students and look to see if their performance, what they sing is better or worse than practice or performance, or you mean look in the brain. Look in the brain. Like that would be really interesting. If we could, there's a number of neuro uh, folks, faculty that work in neuroimaging on campus who we could partner up with that maybe could look in while the person is getting their brain scans if they're practicing or performing, I don't know, to a virtual audience, see what changes in the brain there are. I think that'd be fascinating. I'd love to do that. Uh, that's probably a very future direction though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but great question. And in fact, the National Institutes of Health, because there was another question back there, the National Institutes of Health is gonna have an initiative coming out soon. It's called Music, Aging, and Health. And so these, the zebra finches are really primed for this type of initiative because as I told you about, they're really a good model to look at all three. So that's gonna be great. And there are some people that are imaging, uh, doing neuroimaging and finch brains. So one never knows. Yeah. Thank you. Is there another, is there a last question out there? Last question. We are right Everyone's about at the end of time. Cold, ready to go home. I, oh, there's a third, a third question. Very tangential, but you mentioned this viral um, therapy. Um, is, any, is any of it being um, looked at for amyloid or al Alzheimer's? So uh, the question, whoop, the, uh, the question was, <laughs> at least I can hear that. Uh, so the question was, is any of these uh, viral vectors, uh, gene therapy being used for Alzheimer's. I don't know. I'm not up to date on the Alzheimer's literature. I will tell you though, that when we talk about using these viral vectors in animal models, people are using them for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. I didn't have time to tell you about today, but it feeds into your question. We have a project, a collaboration, where we have a viral vector that drives the expression of the human alpha synuclein gene in area X of our finches. It doesn't interfere with their song, they're happy, they can still produce their song. But for instance, we see that they have over a period of months, they have flat pitch. And so what we're doing is we're trying to understand what is alpha synuclein, the human alpha synuclein, how is it changing this circuitry? Is it like what we see in people who have voice problems in Parkinson's disease? What are some of the genetic changes? Sorry, there's, there's a lot of traffic here. So, so there's a lot of different projects that we have going on in the lab. And I do think based upon, um, you know, so for instance, even though I can't tell you what's going on in terms of gene therapy and Alzheimer's, gene therapy trials in Parkinson's, some of the goal has been to block or inhibit toxic levels of alpha synuclein. The problem is with those trials, they're taking individuals who have mid to late stage disease because that's usually, it's, you know, it's hard to diagnose. So we really need to start the therapy earlier. Right? And so maybe the type of insight we can get from animal models about how the circuitry works, and if we raise this gene or lower this gene and we deliver it here, maybe that can inform and really help us get at the disease earlier. Yeah. Great. 
So many good questions, so many interesting answers. Okay, we're gonna take one last question. Okay. It's gonna be the last one. Here we go. Are any of the finches tone deaf? Do they have any issues sometimes? So the question is, are any of the finches tone deaf? Um, do they, I don't know. I will tell you that if there, some of my colleagues and over the years, uh, there's a lot of people who do hearing research and finches. If you isolate that juvenile finch from hearing his father's song, he has a very poor version of his song. So that hearing influence is important. Don't know whether any of them are tone deaf though, you know, like they are in humans. But I will tell you that some of them have better songs than others. That could re reflect the fact that some of them are better learners than others. Now, when I talked about the aging birds, some, that some of these birds are getting louder with age. That might be related to hearing issues that we need to investigate. We haven't, we haven't picked up yet. Are they having problems hearing themselves? What's going on? Great questions. Thank you. Wow, well, thank you so much. We had so many questions, we ran right to the end of time. What a wonderful, fascinating presentation. Thank you. Thank Thanks you, for being here. And uh, we hope that you'll join us next week, or next month, sorry, um, for the next cafe in the series. Everybody's talking about dopamine. And I should have this right in front of me so I can tell you who's speaking, just a moment. And that will be... glasses and soon hearing aids I'm sure oh yes next next month actually will be uh, specifically about how dopamine influences Parkinson's disease and how it UA leads the way on treatment and that will be dr. I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly Yi Yingwei Chu so uh, we hope you'll join us next month thanks for being here Thank you. Uh, have a great month I'm glad it wasn't quite as cold as some of the nights have been this evening. Uh, take good care, and please come see us at Flandro. Come check out our sharks exhibit. Take care. Thanks, everyone.